Hello and welcome everyone to this podcast on microtubules. In introducing microtubules, let's think about the way they might appear in three different cell types. Up here I have a non-dividing cell. Here I have a dividing cell. And down here I have a ciliated cell. So here let's draw the nucleus in the non-dividing cell. And then let's draw the structure here. And the structure here, we'll come back to it later, but it is going to be a microtubule organizing center. As the name implies, this is where microtubules will extend from. And we'll talk later, in fact quite a bit, about how these microtubules will extend from this microtubule organizing center. But as they extend from here, they will have, they may have vesicles attached to them. They may have organelles like say a mitochondria attached to them. They're important in moving these vesicles and organelles around in the cell and also for maintaining their relative positions. Now let's look at this dividing cell and I'm going to redraw the dividing cell. And let's draw it like this instead. Sorry, I, you probably drew it and now you have to redraw it. My bad. But as this cell is dividing and we have, say, chromosomes here, we need to have a mechanism to bring these chromosomes, an equal amount of the chromosomes from one in, from the middle to each end of the dividing cell. And that's achieved by these microtubular organizing centers. And in this case, we, they have a name that we're gonna call a centrosome. And we'll talk a little bit more about centrosomes later but they will extend from these specialized microtubule organizing centers, microtubules towards the DNA. And then they will bring the chromosomes back across. We also call these specialized microtubules here, we call these spindle fibers. And the ability of these spindle fibers to extend out to the chromosomes and then retract back is very important in segregating the chromosomes. Now in these ciliated cells, we'll have basement membrane proteins here that will have the microtubules extend into these cellular protrusions. And these microtubules that will go into these cellular protrusions, in fact, they help push these out, and they will also help provide the mechanical movement of the cilia or the flagellum, but here I drew cilia. Okay, next I would like to talk about the structure of microtubules. Remember, we said that the subunit of microtubules are a protein called tubulin. What I didn't tell you is that there are two types of tubulins. There's a alpha and a beta, and that they will form a heterodimer. Hetero for different and dimer for two of them. I'm going to draw alpha as the red tubulin subunit, and I'm going to draw beta in blue. Now what will happen is they will form these repeating units of alpha, beta subunits. And a typical microtubule will contain 13 of these filaments, but it will have this repeating unit of beta, alpha, beta, alpha, beta, alpha. At the bottom here, which we call the negative N, it will always have an alpha subunit. And at the top here, this will be called the plus N, and it will always have a beta subunit. That's how we know the directionality of, of these um, microtubules. As I mentioned, we will have 13 of these, and they will wrap around each other to form the tubule. So 13 microfilaments will equal one tubule or one microtubule. Now these heterodimers are added to both ends. So we'll have these pools of the heterodimers and they are added to the plus end faster. So to signify that I'm going to draw three arrows. They're also added to the negative end but at a much slower rate. So I'll just show that with one arrow. 
So overall, they appear to be growing at the plus in, or moving in the direction of the plus in, just because the subunits are being added to it at a quicker rate. The plus and negative have nothing to do with charges. It just is a way to differentiate between the two ends. Now, the beta subunit, I should mention, can bind to GTP. And typically speaking, the plus end of the microtubule contains a lot of GTP bound beta subunits. As we move down this direction, it contains fewer of the beta subunits with GTP. Often it's been hydrolyzed. But to maintain this tip here, so that it can keep growing, we need the GTP. GTP bound beta tubulin allows it to grow faster at the positive end. All right, a couple things I haven't said yet that I want to make sure we know is that the diameter of this tubule with these 13 um, microfilaments is approximately 25 nanometers. Now these are very dynamic tubules. They can be stabilized and they can be destabilized. So let's write a few, or at least an, an example of each of those. So stabilization of microtubules, and sometimes I'll just write MT for microtubules. Some drugs can do this, and a very important one is called Taxol. It can stabilize the microtubules so that they cannot break down. They can also be stabilized by MAP proteins, and that this stands for microtubule associated protein. Microtubules can also be destabilized, so destabilization of microtubules. Cold temperatures can destabilize it, pressure, certain drugs like colchicine and nicotazole. And finally, high concentrations of calcium can also destabilize the microtubules. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the growth of a microtubule. We already mentioned that they grow towards both ends, but faster towards the positive end. But I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail about this. So microtubule growth. And we can draw a little table like so. Here we have time. And over here we have the percent of tubulin subunits. So down here we're going to have our A's and our alphas and our betas in relatively small concentrations. So they will form the dimers. And then what will happen is that these dimers will start to oligomerize, forming smaller but stabilized stretches of the alpha and the beta heterodimers. And much like you might see with an exponential growth in a bacterial culture, these will start to grow pretty rapidly and eventually begin to stabilize up here at the top. But what we have here in the middle are these alpha and the betas growing. And I forgot what I had on the other slide, but um, down here, these are our alphas and the red is our beta. I'm not sure if I incorrectly switched those on us, but in this picture, the blue are the alpha and the, the red are the beta. A at this point here, what's happening is both ends are being added to at a fairly constant rate. Still a little faster up here at the positive end, but still growing at both ends. So this here will be in the middle here. This is our growing in our elongation stage here, where it's just getting um, a lot bigger on both ends. And down here, I should have listed this before, this is our lag phase. So not growing too fast here, but once you hit this critical concentration of tubulin subunits, it will take off and begin to grow. Now at some point, it's exceeded its ability to get any larger, and we will hit this plateau phase, where subunits are being added and removed from here at the same rate. So it stays at a constant size. Now a couple points I want to make here is that the dimers these here are attached to each other using weak hydrophobic interactions. This is advantageous for a couple reasons. The first is it allows for the tubule to grow at a fairly quick rate. You don't need a lot of energy to have these this dimer say here and this dimer here to bind to each other. 
it also is important because it allows the microtubule to shrink in a fairly rapid manner as well. And sometimes you want the micro microtubule to shrink. And so having these weak hydrophobic interactions is important for the dynamics of the microtubule. Okay, let's talk about this concept of treadmilling. And in talking about the concept of the treadmilling, I want to use this diagram here. It's easier to show this picture here than to draw it, um, though I'm a big fan of drawing this. In this case, it's, a, it's better to use this picture, I think. So let's first talk about when it occurs. So treadmilling, when tubulin is added at the plus end and when tubulin is removed from the negative end. This happens when tubulin concentration is higher at the plus end than the critical concentration. And what I mean by the critical concentration is just the concentration that is needed in order for tubulin to be added. But for treadmilling to happen, you have to have the concentration of tubulin at a higher concentration so that it adds to it at a faster rate. The other thing that has to happen is, is that the tubulin concentration is lower at the negative end than the critical concentration. So in practice what this means is the concentration of the tubulin is high at the plus end. It will add to this end and if we just want to follow these that have just been added here and I put a little red X above it and because it's losing tubulin at the minus end and adding at the plus end what happens is this initial addition that we saw here is now in the middle and you allow time to continue continue to add to the plus end and remove from the minus end this initial subunits at the plus end are now further down and eventually they'll find their way all the way to the end and eventually be um, lost at the end and in, in physiological practice, this is how you're going to extend the microtubule in this direction for whatever reason that has to occur in this particular cell. So now I want to talk about this term here called dynamic instability. This helps explain how a microtubule will move towards that positive direction, but also shrink at given times. And we talked a little bit about this, but let me go ahead and draw a microtubule here. Okay, so just to remind you, we have our repeating dimers of our alpha and our betas, alpha betas, alpha betas. The alpha subunits in this picture here are shown in red and the betas are shown in blue. In this picture, this is our negative end and this is our positive end. At the positive end, the beta subunits are bound to GTP, as I've mentioned before. We call this a GTP cap. And as long as GTP is bound here, in fact what we will see is we'll see several rows deep into the microtubule, the beta subunits will be bound to GTP. And again, as long as the GTP is bound here, there's going to be a preferential binding to this positive end and it will allow for growth to go in this direction. But sometimes you want it to shrink and go in this direction. So how will you make this shrink? Well the way it shrinks is GTP is hydrolyzed to GDP. When GDP is bound here, so the GDP bound beta subunits are not as tightly bound. So once they are bound to GDP, the microtubule will begin to shrink in this direction. And in fact, it can shrink all the way down to the very base of it. But in reality, what often happens is that the microtubule will remain balanced. It will grow, it'll shrink, it'll grow, it'll shrink. It is this dynamic instability of this microtubule that allows it to go back and forth. 
by either being bound to GTP, which would be equal to growth, or GDP, which would be equal to shrinkage of the microtubule. Next, I want to talk a little bit about centrosomes. Remember, the centrosomes are these microtubule organizing centers that are used during cell division to move the chromosomes to the proper cells. So let's describe the centrosome. So the centrosome I'm going to draw like so. And within the centrosome are these two structures that we call the centrioles. And what's found in this sphere of, of the centrosome are small little circles all the way through. And these circles in a three-dimensional appearance will appear like that. And they are held together and characterized by another tubulin that we haven't talked about, gamma tubulin. The gamma tubulin will recruit the alpha and the beta subunits to each of these gamma tubulin centers here. And from each of these, the microtubule will extend just like we've shown on the past few whiteboards by adding dimers to these ends so that microtubules will extend from the centriole out. So near here is the minus end of the microtubule and out here is the plus end. Again, going towards the plus. And within the centriole, of course, we'll see some back and forth, growing and, and shrinking, growing and shrinking. In a practical sense, when it binds DNA, for instance, and needs to pull that DNA t towards itself, um, it's going to shrink. It'll grow towards the DNA, bind it, and when cell division is complete, it will, or before cell division is complete, it will bring that DNA back across towards the centriole, or towards the centrosome. The next thing I want to talk about are these microtubule associating proteins which we'll just call MAPS. So let's draw a microtubule. And I'm not going to draw all the subunits here. I'm just going to draw it like so, where we have our negative end here and our positive end here. And so we can have a couple of classes of microtubule proteins. The first is a class we'll call TIP proteins. These TIP proteins will bind to the positive end, and they will stabilize the microtubule. These tip proteins will stop it from destabilizing. They, they protect this end. Now, counter to that, there are maps that we call catastrophins. As the name implies, when they bind to the tip, the positive tip of the microtubule, they will cause the microtubule to shrink. In fact, when they bind, they will cause the microtubule to rapidly move in one direction. So they destabilize, stimulating ev events that we call catastrophes. So you can imagine, if we were thinking about cell division, when these microtubules extend to bind to the chromosomes, that these tip proteins are going to be very important to make sure that the microtubule binds to the DNA and doesn't do anything with it, doesn't allowed to go further or go back, but it holds it in a stable position until it's needed to retract. And then, towards the end of cell division, when we're trying to pull the DNA back to its new cell, that's when the catastrophins come in. And they'll bind here. And in doing so, the microtubule, as I mentioned before, will shrink. And as it shrinks, it brings with it the DNA that's attached to it. So a very effective way to send the microtubule out to bind to DNA and then to bring it back to the cell during cell division. All right, the last thing I'm going to talk about are microtubule motor proteins. To explain this, let's draw a nerve cell. This nerve cell, like most cells will have a nucleus, and this main part here we call the cell body. This part here that extends, and it can extend a meter or more, is the axon. And down here we have the axon terminal. 
where the axon ends. It may interact with a, another nerve cell. It may interact with a target destination like a muscle. But the ability to be able to communicate from this cell body a distance of a meter or more to the next cell that it's targeted requires a, a mechanism to move things, material, from one end of the cell to the, to the end of the cell. And the way it does that is by having these microtubules. There will be elaborate networks of these microtubules going in both directions here. But as you can imagine, they're going to be growing towards the axon terminal. So these will be our plus ends, and these will be our minus ends. And there will be a microtubule organizing center here where they extend from. Now on these microtubules here that I've shown here in green, various cargos, they could be organelles or they might be vesicles, will bind to the microtubules. And they will take the cargo in this direction or cargo could bind to the microtubules and move it in the opposite direction. So there must be a mechanism to allow transport of specific cargo towards the positive end and a mechanism to allow transport towards the negative end. And they do that by using specialized motor proteins. Okay, I'm going to draw this microtubule outside of the cell here, just so I have a little bit more room to work with. And I'm going to talk about these two motor proteins that are going to move cargo towards the negative end and cargo towards the positive end. So the first motor protein I'm going to talk about is called kinesin. So kinesin grabs cargo and moves it towards the positive end of the microtubule. All right, so let's talk about the other motor protein. And the other mo motor protein is structurally similar, but it moves towards the negative end. These motor proteins are called dynein. So dynein pro motors move cargo towards the negative microtubule end. Both of these are ATPases. Hydrolyzing ATP is what allows these motor proteins to move cargo in one direction or the other. Okay, that's all I have for this podcast. If you have any questions at all, please let me know. If not, I'll see you in class. Bye.